Uh, as US Air Force pilot, how do you look at the RFP details of Indian Air Force? That's question one. The second question is, how do you compare your F-18 program to Eurofighter and Rafab? Third question is, why do you think India should look at F-18 more favorably than F-16, which can be a cost-effective and lighter and faster proposition? Some of these questions. Okay. And those tie together, really. Um, and, and I'll miss a little bit, and you can prompt me as we go here. So the RFP, and, and I was on the program when it came out in about 2005 or so. Uh, as I recall, it was originally about replacing or adding to the Mirage 2005 capability, so a light fighter. And so that was a light fighter in a mixed fleet with the Su-30 and then the other, uh, you know, they had the 29s and uh, at that time still 23, and of course you had some Mirage, et cetera, but a light fighter, so a high-low mix, if you will. When we offered this super, it kind of shifted that from a light fighter to a medium. And and what we saw was the French followed suit. So they dropped the Mirage and put Rafale in. Eurofighter joined. They hadn't been a part of the original response. So it shifted the whole capability argument up a notch. And I think and I think that's the right thing because the medium multi-role airplane adds a lot that you can't get from a lightweight fighter. Highway fighters are fun, but when you need long-range endurance, persistent, heavy weapons, long-range strike, then the medium airplane provides a lot of that um, for, for different reasons. So I think you see effectively uh, uh, two groupings that have followed. Those who stayed with the lightweight fighter, which of course F-16 won the lightweight fighter competition in the U.S. 40 years ago. Uh, Gripen, of course, is, is the lightweight and the 29. So those are those are clearly lightweight fighters, great airplanes, but a different capability set. Then you move up a notch to the, these medium weight, the big twins, as I call them, and that's a different level of capability. And uh, so they all, the other two, uh, follow us in capability, but are older designs of here. If you just look at the timeline that's out there. Uh, Eurofighter, of course, was designed as a uh, as an air-to-air -air airplane. So the Tranche One's air-to-air, -air, Tranche Two's better air-to-air, -air, Tranche Three would be an air-to-ground machine. Hasn't been built. They don't have an ESA radar because that technology just hasn't migrated there yet. So they lag well behind where the U.S. is, just because we had the dollars to put into it, billions and billions of dollars and tens of years to create the ESA radar. It's on our airplane, the F-22, the F-35. Um, that technology just hasn't gone abroad yet. But are you sure that Europe, Eurofighter doesn't have ice radar? They don't. They have Is one demonstrator. The well, they have a demonstrator. Basically, they don't have, but uh, they're working for it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Right. So they, they, they will have at some point in time. I see. But today they do not. So, and today what they would have demonstrated would have been an ESA face on an existing radar backplane which is like having a new monitor on an old computer. So it looks good, but it doesn't do a lot more than the other one did. Mm -hmm. They'll get there, but they are 20 years behind. They'll advance quickly because they'll pick up some technology that we, we've used. And we've matured a lot. Um, same with Rafal. They've got one. They're a little bit ahead, I think, of Europe fighter, but they've only got one demonstrator or something like that. They're not flying it. It's not in production. Right? It's not in their production airplane. And of course, they only build about 10 airplanes a year, so it'll be a long time before they can accumulate the experience. As I said, we fly 10,000 hours a month, so our experience level is astronomical. They don't fly that much a year as a fleet. So that's why we can mature our airplanes so much more quickly. Um, both of those airplanes, in fact, all of the other five were designed as, um, as air defense airplanes first, with a secondary role of strike where we were designed as a strike airplane with secondary mission as air defense. So from a balanced force, I think that that's why we fit better 
with the Sioux 30 and with uh, PAC FA or FR, uh, what do we call it, FGFA, than then with the other guys. And the Russian drive program. Right. Oh. Right, right. Uh, which will produce a great airplane, but again, it'll be a high end airplane. So I think if you look at, at what uh, a balanced force would look like if you plug in a Super Hornet, if you plug in a Eurofighter, you plug in a Rafale, you'll see a big difference. You'll see a real shift up high without much addition in the strike capability. Um, and the fact that we're in combat and have been for years, nobody else has done that. And that's when you mature combat aircraft most quickly, as you would have seen in cargo and other things. Your airplane advances more quickly than you're in combat than any other but time. But hasn't this platform been more of a maritime platform and less of Air Force platform, per se? Yeah, well, it is. Well, so the, the Navy is the uh, third largest Air Force in the world. Okay. So they fly about 1,100 airplanes. There's not many Air Forces that do. So uh, that is a major air force. Uh, it also operates from land. So what this airplane does is it, it, it can operate off of carrier, but it can also operate off land. So uh, the classic, for example, seven. If I interrupt you here, yeah. In Afghanistan, the the FAD is it solely operating off the deck or is it operating from the? Both, predominantly off the deck. Off so the deck. seven hour mission, in and out. So it flies a long way. Uh, but it can operate off the land and does in some instances. It, it depends on what, what you're trying to get to. In some cases, it's easier to get to it from sea than it is from land based on overfly restrictions and things of that nature. Uh, but it operates off of both, and, and the Australians, of course, are purely land-based operators. And on the classic Hornet, the predecessor, there's seven air forces, so Switzerland and Finland and Spain and Malaysia and Kuwait. All the dishes are operated from land. They're all operated from land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, if you can operate off a carrier, you can operate off anything. Oh, right. So uh, unprepared fields, it loves it. You know, short short runways, high altitude. So added advantage to this platform. Is that correct? Okay. And then, uh, so it follow through to your your last one, I believe, which was uh, about the F-16. F-16, a great airplane. As I said, it won the lightweight fighter competition. It's a peer to our classic Hornet. Um, but it's a lightweight fighter. So it's growth limited. It's, it's, they've done a great job with it. But it is what it is. And it's at the end of its day. The U.S. Air Force hasn't taken delivery in seven years, I think. Of a, they're all export. And the airplane on offer here is not a U.S. Air Force airplane. It's the one that was developed for the UAE. So it's a derivative of the Block 60, which was a UAE airplane. Not flown so by the US Air Force. They, they are offering the UAE version to India? Yes. Okay. Well, it's based on the UAE version. Oh, okay. Based on that. Because the UAE configuration? Correct. Oh. Correct. So uh, amended to make sure it meets your requirements. It's amended mm -hmm. to make sure it meets your requirements. But at that, it's a smaller airplane. So it. Its ESA is smaller, it's an air-cooled, it, it can never have the performance of a big water-cooled, liquid-cooled ESA like we have on board. It's just a limitation in size of the airplane. So this was again designed for growth. This is 25% bigger than our Classic, which was the same size as an F-16. So it's just a bigger jet, more capability, and, and uh, designed for this advanced capability. Different environment when you're looking into the ground, obviously, and trying to break out targets or look at high resolution pictures. And, and the pictures that come out of an ESA radar are much like you would have seen in a FLIR, uh, which is pretty astounding when you think about it. Radar used to be blob technology. You know, you look in radar and you see a shape and you're trying to imagine what that was. Uh, whereas now it's a picture. And, uh, and more importantly, it's all digital. So again, we can overlay it with databases on the airplanes. We can overlay it with our FLIR picture. You can slew with the helmet-mounted queuing system. When you designate a target with that, you can bring the other sensors to, uh, to bear on that. So what you can do with the digital suite, particularly when it's totally integrated like this is, is very powerful. Um, so this, again, optimized for strike, very capable air-to-air, -air, but it handles air-to-air -air with technology, not with, not with speed and acceleration.
because the same thing that makes it a great short field airplane makes it not a very fast airplane. It's got a fat wing. What you know, I mean, these days you have this question of strike packages. They have the air dominance aircraft. Right. You have the EW aircraft, you know, declaring the space, and then, then he will come in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and do the vehicle. But when you're operating, let's say, in the case of USA, uh, either they integrate with the USAP to make these packages. Right. Or this airplane itself will provide. It does it all. And it can. Like I said, the technology allows it to do that. Uh, it's not as good as an F-22, but it's better than most anything else in the world because the ESA is. The ESA makes all the difference. Uh, the combination of ESA and a long-range BVR missile is how you, you protect your fleet. But it's really more for self-defense than to, to run a clear sky scenario. So we fly a high-low mix, just, just like you do. And that's the difference in big air forces. You can have a high-low mix. In any case, uh, as far as the Iraq and Afghanistan scenario is concerned, you don't need all There is no way to throw it. But you've got to make sure there's nothing up. So, uh, you know, you still need to have that air superior, that air dominance. You know, for us, uh, the last time an American soldier in contact was killed by an airplane was in Korea, 1951. Mm -hmm. So since then, you don't, they don't look up. They don't have to. So that's huge right there. That's a huge enabling capability for the Army and everybody else. And also for our strike packages, because you don't have to look up. You do, as you would, but clear air, that makes a big difference. So that's, that's, that's how we are where we are. You know, this, this was built around a force mix, being able to go on your own, but ideally flying with a high-low mix. And India fights the same way. So. You've got a uh, great high-low mix of airplanes, and so you, you can stand alone. Um, and I think that's why having the, the combination gives you complete dominance across the whole spectrum, from close air support all the way to air superiority. And uh, neither one of these two airplanes, this or the suit, could give you that by itself. But together, it's an incredible package.